Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 90 of the I Rock Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and I am known as I Rock Knits everywhere on the internet. And I Rock is just Corey spelled backwards. As usual, you can find all of my knitting designs and patterns on Ravelry, Love Crafts, Etsy, and my website, irockknits.com. I did not mention that enough, and so I put a big note at the top of my podcast to say, you can get all of my patterns in four places. So you have lots of opportunities to find uh, my knitting designs out there, of which I have about 75 um, new designs in the last five years. What am I wearing today? This is going to be our sweater of the week. It is the Wave of Change jacket. Um, I knit the cardigan. I used Barrett Wool Company. That is Eight. Anderson's um, yarn company and I got it as a um, when they had an update the yarn was just available again the end of last week um, in these kind of marled colorways so red and white light gray and white dark gray and white maybe like a tan and white and and so um, this is a bulky or kind of chunky weight yarn and I knit this jacket um, I cast it on beginning of January and then I told you during the sweater camp, I had kind of a few issues with my knitting of it, not with the actual jacket. Um, I did an extra row rounds of raglan increases. I'm really glad I did. It provided a little more room at the bust. It is um, shorter than I had wanted. I'll have a picture in here, but I think it's a little cropped and that's okay, but not for what I have on today. Like I just threw on leggings and um, a turtleneck this morning and so I wouldn't necessarily style it like this um, was the pattern was well written easy to follow you do this pearl ridge like every eight eight rows my buttons I also felt like were a little small once I got them on um, sewed on last night I you know they could just be a little bit bigger because the yarn is chunkier I didn't button this top one but um, here I think you can see that they're just, you know, they're probably like not quite one inch buttons and they the, the scale of them might be a little small, but they're the right color. And I, I had a hard time finding, um, I bought some other red, which they leaned more pink and white and I was gonna alternate. I just didn't like them as well. So I'm gonna live with this for a little bit and see, I have two skeins of yarn left and um, most of a third. So plenty of yarn if I decide that I wanna go back and lengthen the sweater something I probably never will do because I'm lazy like that. But anyway, this is by um, Bayron Handmade. That's Denise Bayron. Um, she has a kind of a chunky yarns as options listed, it, but the yarn weight in the pattern is considered bulky. It's 14 stitches to four inches. So it's, you know, it's heavier, you know, than Aaron, but anyway. I know a lot of people have done it in a lot of different yarns. Um, and I saw out on Ravelry that a number of people have held, held yarn double in order to make it. The tags for the pattern are that it's crew necked, cropped, a cuffed sleeve, in the round, um, for male and female, um, or let's just call it unisex. That would be the better term, probably right. Um, it's seamless, top down, worked flat. There's a written pattern. The pattern is $10 and I am an advocate for raising the prices of patterns, but I was also shocked that it was $10, right? I was just like, wow, she sold a ton of these. This was a super popular pattern and I still have all my price points for my sweaters at $7 and I really feel like they should definitely be eight and 10 would be better, but she's going for what her time and energy on a pattern was worth and I applaud that. <laughs> So I did buy the pattern. The jacket gets its name from the pearl ridges that create concentric rings around the body. The name also references the last year of change in the Firebird community. We collectively became more aware, more woke. I believe every human feels the need to be included and valued. As we transition into a new decade, my hope is that we can become a more compassionate community where we focus on our common humanity rather than our differences. Then we can create a space where kindness is the norm and everyone is welcome. In that spirit, this pattern was designed to be gender neutral and size inclusive. No single garment can fit everybody, but I have included tips to help you customize the pattern to fit your body. I hope you'll feel pride when making and wearing it. Um, 
yeah, it, it is, um, the sizes aren't listed um, on the front page of this and I didn't look at my actual pattern because I put it away last night, but it's it goes from one through seven. So my guess is that it's got that XXL and double XL and moves up from there. Um, it is also written as a pullover. And my issue with this pattern, well, it wasn't an issue until someone told me, but when I was at Sweater Cramp, you remember, they said that she had added short rows to the pullover version, but there were no short rows at the back neck of this sweater. And there, and depending on the way your body is shaped, you can have sweaters that ride up in the back because the seam for your shoulder has to go up and over like your shoulder blades, um, which are up higher than your chest. So sometimes that will cause the back of a sweater to ride up and so that you'll put short rows in there to lengthen the back of the sweater so that it hangs even. If you're a person who often feels like the fronts of your sweater are hanging lower and you have to hike your sweater back, short rows can help that. Um, I, I was able to just block the back, just pull it down a little more and I'm not feeling like I have that problem with it being too short in the back but I knew about it because someone had told me at camp and then I would like to take a look at the pullover pattern to see if she, I'm pretty sure she probably put them right at the back neck and a lot of people don't like starting a pattern that way right top down should be easy but then you got to do those short rows so I totally get it but this is wave of change jacket and um yeah I'm I'm really happy with it but I have an issue of not an issue i have a concern about the yarn um and the wearability over time because i did find that my sweater got fuzzy during my knitting of it so i worked on it for about six weeks off and on because i finished that blanket in january so even though i cast it on i never worked on it but i did take it to knitting a few times and i pulled the the sweater in and out of the bag and it got like a halo already and so then i took a look at the yarn and it is too um twists two plies of unspun yarn so there when you have a fiber that is unspun you're gonna get more pilling for sure and i'll talk about that when i get to this shawl but it there is more surface area and it's not twisted on itself so it's not wrapped into anything tight if it's not plied it means it's not twisted and so as you rub on that it's the fibers are going to floof up and even though this is two plies so they're twisted together they're both unspun and i have a fear that this might be a sweater that will pill i don't know that and if any of you knit with the barrett wool um in her this kind of unspun tweed you know or you know plied together barber pulled whatever you want to call it yarn i guess you wouldn't call it tweed but um, plied yarn let me know if it's not it you know if it's not pilling if it's really holding up well that would be great to know it hasn't there aren't pills but i'm seeing a halo it's fuzzier than i expected and that's great if it just stays like that so i'm hoping that the the actual little twist of those two together helps it to keep it from being you know something that pills i have a gleaner things pill superwash merino pills you just glean it right and move on but i just thought i would mention it that i didn't look at that when i purchased the yarn and um it's just something you should note. Then I have three audiobooks to do briefly this week. The first one is called 800 Grapes by Laura Dave. I listened to it on audio. I found it to be a very quick listen. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was just a nice story. If you are into wine or vineyards, um, visiting wine, wine samplings, um, this story um, revolves around a family who owns a vineyard and the daughter has gone off um, to be a lawyer in uh, LA and um, she's gonna get married and a crisis happens and so she runs away and heads back home to you know kind of the the wine country area of California um, and when she gets there her family has changed drastically things have aren't the same as what they were in her childhood or as she grew up and so um, yeah it was it was quite good I would recommend it then I read The Sun Does Shine, and that is by Anthony Ray Hinton, and that was for my book club this last month, and I did not enjoy this book, but I was glad I read it. This book made my heart sad, and I have been 
finding that I am a little more depressed and down during you know COVID and what we have going on, it's easy for me to go to a place that's not good for me, right? Like watching the news, being on social media, I'm, I'm, I'm having to kind of limit myself or I get, I get kind of down. This was an amazing story. Anthony Hinton was sentenced to death row wrongly. In 1985, he was arrested for um, the murder of two people, a murder he did not commit, a murder in which he had an alibi, he was at work, he was clocked in at work, um, he was seen by other employees being at work on that night, and many, many months later, um, they arrested him, he was tried, his lawyer did not fight for him, they, it, it, it was just, just, Error after error after error was made with this man. He spent 27 years on death row, and in on death row, you are in a you know seven by what did he say seven five by seven cell or eight by ten cell um, by yourself, and it it you get out for like a 15 minute walk a day. Um, he was exonerated and he was released, and it was all a part of that. Um, Innocence Project that Brian Stevenson wrote that book about that I read last year, The Lawyer, that's got made into a movie. So um, I was very familiar with, you know, what happens, what has happened to some of these people who are on death row, men, you know, we rarely have, anyway. Um, and he, he kept his spirit up. And so that part of it is really hopeful. He talks about what it was like living there, how he could yell and talk to some of the other men on death row, what it was like to have one of the men go to the electric chair and be walked down the aisle and how they would all bang in their cells just to be with that person. Um, he said that you know many of them were, um, it was just their circumstances that got them in a bad place and yeah, it, very good book club book, right? Good uh, it, discussion. Uh, we have a lot of um, African American men um, and women on being held in prisons for you know uh, marijuana, uh, even small amounts of marijuana they can afford. You know, some of them can't afford to have a lawyer, and now marijuana is legal in many of the states that they're being held on you know, small quantities. It We just have, you know, we have some work to do, in my opinion. I'll, you know, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, I, I just thought it was sad. It made, even the first few chapters, I was just like, this is when you find out how it went so wrong and that he's lost 27 years of his life. And at book club last week, our leader had done research and he has never been compensated by the state of Alabama for his time in jail. Like, he's free, but he lost 27 years. And his mother died while he was in prison. They were very close, so I won't go on and on about that. But, you know, if you want to read something that's good for you, like, you should read it. We should all know. We should all hear these stories. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't poorly written. It wasn't like bad to read in any way or shape or form. My empathetic heart just continued to break. And so that's where that came from. The third book I read is called The Last Chance Library. I love anything with book or library in the name of it. I think that's a pretty popular genre right now, writing about libraries and library systems. This is a story of a young woman whose mother has passed and her mother was a librarian and she works at the library now and she's worked there for 10 years and she really hasn't let go of just living in her mom's house, going to work. And it's a small town in England um, and they're gonna lose their local library. And so she's gonna lose her job and um, it's the story of her, she, her and her She's life. like 30 years old and just hasn't moved on and hasn't really even finished her grieving process for her mother and that the town rallies around it yeah it's barely feel good in the end um it, but how that happens was surprising and yeah it was it was quite good I would highly recommend Last Chance Library as well what have I been watching 
I watched seven seasons of the show called Younger with Sutton Foster. And I think I talked about this, well, I've talked about it to a number of people, but Sutton Foster wrote the new book that came out, Hooked, this fall, How Crafting Saved My Life. And I was unsure who she was. I was like, who is that? Um, and so I looked her up and she was in the show Younger for seven seasons. And I was like, how did I not know about seven seasons of a show? You'd think you would have heard of it. And it was on TV land. But now it's available on Amazon Prime and maybe one other place. I can't remember. Um, I really enjoyed it. It it The show was just every night I liked sitting down. I am not a 30-minute sitcom person. I do not like short funny, sweet, that is not what this is. It is kind of a shorter version. It's maybe 35 minutes. I don't know, the commercials are taken out, you know, so. Um, but the premise is she is a 40 year old, um, divorced, newly getting divorced mother of a 20 year old, 18 year old girl um, who is going to India for a semester and she can't get a job. She needs a job desperately and she keeps getting turned down and she was in publishing when she was first married and she, that's, she's trying to break into that and she pretends to be 27 and she gets the job. And she starts working for the publishing company and she does a really good job and nobody knows that she's 27 or 40 instead of 27. But for seven seasons, they're all different ways of them trying to keep it a secret when people do eventually find out. So. Um, I just ordered uh, Sutton Foster, so, um, but I ordered her book via Amazon, and I'm gonna give a copy away in the knit along too, so I will gift that um, to someone and have it shipped so that you can take a look at it. She's mostly a crocheter, but she also does other DIY crafty stuff um, from what I can gather, which is why I didn't order the book this fall. So that's what I've been watching. I'm also watching the Olympics a little bit and enjoying that. And then yesterday we watched the Super Bowl game. And uh, I always think it's, I feel so sad for the team that loses, <laughs> you know, especially when they lose in the last few minutes and it was such a big game. and. I didn't, I don't have skin in the game for either team, but I kind of wanted Cincinnati to win because they just have never even gone there. And, and I do think they played a little better, um, but the Rams lost a bunch of players during the game and that was sad too, right? Like they finally get to the Super Bowl and then they get hurt in the free, I mean, football. I, I like watching. I was knitting away on my, putting my button bands on my sweater and measuring and and it was long because the halftime was so long. And boy, was the halftime over my head. I'm too old. I was like, oh my gosh. Like I knew who the people were, but I think you had to be kind of a 90s kid, um, late 90s maybe even, um, to really have, be, have that be your music, right? The music of your era, the rap and the, you know, all that stuff. So that was kind of like, I was like, wow, I am out of it. It was another another yes I'm getting old situation. I have a tip or trick for you this week. Um, I often watch my podcasts on faster speed. Because I listen to books on faster speed, I usually have them at 1.5, drives my husband crazy. But did you know that you can speed up your podcasts on YouTube and watch them at a faster pace if you are just trying to get through, you know, or there's just a lot of, a person has a slower voice tempo. I can talk really fast sometimes and I have to think about being slower, but if you go to um, the, the gear that is underneath your screen, there's a, you know, it's shaped like a flower, but it's like a gear, um, kind of got a scalloped edge with a hole in the middle. Um, in the bottom kind of right hand corner on my iPad, I assume that's where it is for everybody else. You can click on that gear and then it will pop up with a menu to slow up or speed up or slow down the video. And so I thought sometimes um, I have two or three I wanna watch. And so if I can watch it at just a little bit faster, you know, speed, it doesn't bother me because I'm used to li listening to things faster. Um, it, and I'm not garbling people's voices but I just thought I would share that that there is a way for you to speed up kind of the podcast and the other thing that I wanted to add is that I put you know 
pictures in the corner of my podcast. Um, and I know you can do time stamping down below, but I I edit on my iPad and it's just it's much easier to do that if you're editing on your computer and I just like to edit in my recliner on my iPad. So I put the you know picture for Corey stories or the sweater of the week so that if you don't want to listen to a section you should be able to just if you're watching it on a device you should or on your TV you should just be able to scroll ahead and see as you're moving it forward the little box pop up so that you would know what that the next section is over so if you never want to listen to the audiobooks or if you don't want to listen to Corey stories or whatever you could just move your thing forward and look for because I always put audiobooks of the week up in the corner and that's my way of allowing people to be able to move through the podcast quicker if they choose to but I have only I maybe have not mentioned that in a year and a half so I just thought when I was talking about speeding up the podcast maybe I should also mention that I put those little I don't even know what they're called pop-ups pop-ups in the corner pretty big right usually right up here I think I'm looking at my maybe it's this side whatever um, I always put it there so that you can you know and if you left off at something and then you for some reason you came back and it wasn't where you were you should be able to scroll to just the part where I'm just talking about the sweater of the week or the shawl of the week or whatever so I just thought I would share that as well okay um, I have a finished object besides my sweater this week I've been trying to get some things off the needles because I have two new design collaborations that I have to take on but I finished another Christina hat and this time I did it in this kind of olive green. That's coming out not as pretty as this color is. This is very um, soft green. It's not bright, it's olive -y. Kind of, you know, more this color than this color with the sunshine, but kind of depends on your monitor as well. But I did get a second, um, so I decided, I just had a few minutes and I, I was getting close to the decreases. This hat has been in a bag for a while and I thought, oh, I'll take that with and I will get that finished up. So I did finish another Christina hat. I am working on the Christina cowl. It was originally my intention to have it come out today. Happy Valentine's Day. I've not said that yet. I put a Valentine shirt on the mannequin with little puppies on it, but, um, but, missing about two and a half weeks in January for COVID and then losing my mother-in-law put me way behind. And so I have to announce today that May Eichelberger, my mother-in-law passed away on February 2nd. Peacefully, my husband was there. Um, she never woke up um, while he was there. They called him that morning that she was unresponsive. The day before she had been not feeling well and she just wanted to sleep and she said to Ross I just I don't want to talk right now I just want to go back to bed and and so he let her and then she passed by noon the next day and the you know care center had called him so he had driven down early in the morning um, and he got there about 8 30 and by noon she never woke up and you know it he was there with her um, his brother was gone and we knew um, that we were kind of on call and so I got a call from her during sweater camp um, on that Saturday and I was out of the the ballroom area and she called and I thought oh I better answer maybe she can't get in touch with Ross and so I answered and I said may I'm at sweater camp and she said yeah I know I just wanted to hear how Kylie's birthday dinner was <laughs> and so I was so glad that I answered and I talked to her and that she was fully cognizant and um, and just wanted to know we had Kylie's birthday dinner on Thursday night and sweater camp was on Friday and she called on Saturday and um, and we visited and I told her that I was knitting on a sweater and that I was at Stillwater and they had the snow sculptures and so I had gotten a chance to talk to her and she called a number of people um, we had the funeral last Friday and um, it was very nice um, and very small there were maybe 20 people there we just had our closest um, family. Um, she had a two, a two cousins and, and um, their spouse came. Um, the pastor who did the service 
um, was a cousin of May's and he was young quite a bit younger than May and so he always called her Aunt May but in the family story it came out that they really literally their his mother and May's mother were sisters and it was just the difference in ages um, that you know he would be I would guess that he is probably 20 years younger than May maybe um, since he's still working as a pastor. I mean, he was an older gentleman, but May was 92 in December, and um, it, it, it was hard, it's, it's been hard. One of the biggest things that was challenging was to get in touch with people, and, um, and she had written letters, and so she had an address book, an old-fashioned, handwritten address book, and it was full, just full of everyone she had written to, and phone numbers and we just went through that for days and called people and tried to let people know um, and we we were we paid for her phone we it was on our account and so Ross left um, that one of those days that week with her phone and some of her belongings um, and Kylie and I Kylie came out that a couple times that week just to be here and to help with things because um, you know I'll tell you but um, her phone rang and it was in a drawer. My husband had just put it in like a phone. He had turned called, had it turned off. So he put the cord in our cord drawer, you know, like the, you know, that kind of drawer. And it was ringing and Kylie and I were standing in the kitchen. We're like, what is that noise? What is that noise? And we looked around and I opened that drawer and her phone was ringing. And so I answered the phone and it was her college roommate calling to tell her that she was in the hospital and that her husband had just passed away on January 25th. And this woman was so sad because she just wanted to talk to May because she was in the hospital and May was such a good listener. And she didn't really want to give me her name. And I was really, I kept asking, I kept saying, this is, you know, her daughter-in-law and I'd like to tell the boys who, you know, and I never did get her name. We found it later, but she told me she was in the Duluth hospital and that she was doing okay, but you know, she just wanted to talk to me. So that those conversations, those calls are hard, right? You have to continue to to say it over and over again. And and a lot of that fell to Ross and Joel, but we were all kind of taking turns and um Ross's family um gets cremated. That's their their that's what their family chooses to do. And so she was cremated. So there is no need for like a funeral home. I mean there is, but like you know, we don't we didn't have a visitation. We weren't going through a funeral home because she was going to be buried next to her husband, which is up north in Minnesota. And so um we got together on that Saturday we drove down and the boys hadn't written the obituary and they didn't have the funeral they didn't have a brochure and they were like we don't need one there's only gonna be like 18 of us there and whatever and the other daughter-in-law uh, my sister-in-law was like there needs to be a brochure and you guys need to write the obituary and they're like we don't know how well i i know how i was a journalism major in college and my first job one summer before i even graduated from college is i took the ag reports in the morning and i wrote the obituaries <laughs> every morning all summer long and um, so I, I know the format but I will tell you that May had written it out in longhand a, a notice kind of a letter of her life and it was so helpful to have that information and those dates if you have time make yourself a funeral folder I did that on Saturday morning I got up and I went in the office and in a half an hour I put together a folder, I put together songs that I like, a scripture that I like, and I wrote out the dates of my life. Um, I could copy and paste them from a resume and I put them in a folder and I, on the front of the folder I wrote what files on the computer it was in and I printed out everything and told my husband that he needed to do the same. Because if you do that, you're never going to die, ever. <laughs> right? Because you're prepared. <laughs> just trying to bring some levity to the situation here but that's what I told him I said I'm never gonna die because I have my funeral written and ready <laughs> and he's like I cannot believe you did that and I said Ross I wrote the obituary and May had written out everything until 1995 and then there wasn't much of anything so we had to fill that kind of that part in um, there just wasn't as much information and 
her obituary will go in a small town newspaper where they print all that information like it can be as long as you want it to be so you can include that she was a volunteer grandma at the school for eight years and that she was a sunday school teacher and you know those things that were important to her she had written down so i just want to encourage all of you to just write it down it doesn't have to be fancy just write down like where you were born and where you lived and you know how long you were there so if there and if there are people that are there that and you don't live there anymore but they would like to be contacted just jot their names and if you have any information because it it really was a week of just kind of harried phone calls and everybody doing this and that and i said i'll write the obituary i'll write the brochure and then i sent it to them and i said you know i'm happy to make any changes this is your mother and then they had opinions and i don't i didn't want anybody's opinions on what i had written i just wanted it to be done you know it it was fine that they had opinions but i was just like dang <laughs> they you know things moved around and so it, it took it took a day or two to kind of even get those things done and finding a picture of her that wasn't the picture from this christmas where she didn't look her best we wanted but we didn't want a picture from you know 1948 we we wanted a picture that looked like her and I, I had the ability to find some pictures from her husband's funeral where she was standing in the middle of some men and just really smiling and I could crop it and it made just a perfect program but I want to tell those of you who wrote to May when I did her letter drive that there was a folder a box with, you know, like a paper box with a lid and it had all the cards in it like uh, all the cards were there all the letters uh, she was rereading those over and over and over again and her handwriting had gotten very poor in the last uh, probably year she was just so shaky you could hardly read her handwriting and she really was sad about that that she couldn't write and return letters to every single people that person that wrote to her and if if we would have been thinking and, and if she had any technology background at all in a better you know phone plan because she had a flip phone she could have recorded some of that you know some of her letters and we could have printed them out but you know it was I went to my drawer the, the maybe two or three days after we got the news and I pulled out May's letters I had kept Almost every letter May had written us since 2010. And the folder was, you know, like this thick. And we laid them out at the funeral. And she always wrote the time and the date and the temperature up in the corner. And all, everyone, and anyone who talked about her remembered that. You know, she always wrote, the, you know, 5.45 a.m., February 14th. 36 degrees or whatever and it was just her way she was such a good letter writer she was a good storyteller she loved telling stories and and so my husband spoke at the funeral and he said to me I've got to write some I got to write out what I'm going to say and I said no you don't you should just speak from the heart you should just have a few you know stories that you want to tell and he's like okay I'll go back upstairs and so he because um, that's where his computer is and so he went into the kitchen or something about 10 minutes later I printed out a sheet and I walked out and I said here you go and he goes what is this and I said this is your this is your talk these are here are 10 things that I could come up with in 10 minutes to talk about May how wonderful how hard-working she was she worked two jobs she ran a, a summer resort where they cleaned and I mean she was just a hard worker and you know she loved having her hair brushed she would beg the granddaughter she has three granddaughters and she would just beg them to brush her hair she would just sit she loved having her hair brushed in and you know and then the the girls the granddaughters had a couple of stories that they wanted to add but we we came up with some things and and he he did the talk and right at the end he got really choked up and he had to come sit down and um next to me and he he said to me i almost made it through and i said i'm so glad you didn't because it meant more that he didn't just read something that he felt it and I said to him that was important 
for everyone, and there were very few people, but for everyone to see, right, that you weren't just being, you know, a robot up there and talking about your mom. He was so close to his dad, and now they're both gone. And so, and May's number one thing in life was to be with Jim. She would often call and say, I just miss Jim. And he, he died in 2012, so she had been alone for 10 years. And yeah, she just, she really missed him. I'm going to take a quick break here and I'll come back. I do have this picture laying on the table of Kylie with May back in maybe 2003 or so. Um, Kylie was going to karate and they'd come to Virginia. This was taking, taken outside of our garage in Virginia of the two of them together and it was in one of her folders and I I don't have this picture so I kept it I don't I, I don't remember ever seeing it I'm so I'm, I'm assuming we took it with her camera back at the time um, but she will be greatly missed and I know many of you knew of her so I wanted to share that the two shawls that I am sharing today are May's shawls so these are the shawls that I knit and gave to May and gifted to May. And when we got some of our things from Joel and Kaylee, um, Ross's brother, um, the knitted things were in a bag for Corey. Um, they, they knew as they cleaned out her room that these were the knitted things. And so there was a pair of felted clog slippers. And then there was this pink shawl and there was this red shawl. And one of the things that May had said in her notes was, please dress me in pink. I've always liked the color pink. And please, I know I was a bit of a pack rat, but don't let Ross throw everything away. <laughs> and Ross is a bit of a neat Nick and just has always struggled um, with his mother and her quantity of things that she always wanted to have. And they would butt heads sometimes about you know, her refrigerator being over full and her desktop and her coffee table always being full of stuff. And, you know, he, he always wanted her to clean up and tidy up and not have so much stuff. So I thought it was really apropos that one of the sweaters, and I always told Ross and Kylie that I would get pink for grandma for Christmas presents and things because she looked so nice in pink. She had that kind of that complexion, but she also had very white gray hair. And so I thought today, since I washed them and blocked them and I'm going to give them to Ross's sister, she was unable to come to the funeral. She tested positive for COVID um, the day before. And so she was unable to be there. And so I'm going to give these two um, items to his sister. And this one is called the Crosswords at the Coffee Shop by Carrie Steinmetz. And it is like a crescent shawl with flat ends. So it's a really interesting um, construction of a shawl, very easy to knit. And it's kind of got these pinks and purples in it. And I have it kind of wrapped around the shoulders. It, it's not super long, but May loved a good pin, a good brooch, um, some rhinestones. And when I unwrapped these two shawls, there was a silver, oh, I should go get it. Well, that was silly of me. I had the pin laying out, so I went and got it. The pin was in the red shawl, but I know that she often wore rhinestone pins, and so wearing this wrapped around her neck would have been perfect for her because she liked to have a closure, and so it, it's not quite long enough to wrap multiple times. But Crosswords at the Coffee Shop shawl is made with Aran weight yarn on a size eight needle. The gauge is not listed here in the pattern, um, the pattern was test knit and it says that it's discontinued and so I don't know if that means that it's no longer available at all. Um, it came out in February 2012 so I, I shouldn't probably share it if people want to make it but I just thought that maybe it's available somewhere. And then the second shawl is the Summer Flies shawl knit in a worsted weight and I think this is um, uh, it's it's a little fuzzy, so I think it has a little mohair or a pocket in it. But I did knit, you know, 17 or whatever of those shawls over the years. And, um, yeah, I just was really pleased that even though she had cleaned out multiple times throughout the years, these 
items were still in use and she still had them at the home so that was that was really and the summer fly shawl um, can be knit in any weight of yarn but this was I knit it in worsted 12 stitches and 22 rows and four inches on a size 8 needle which is bigger than a worsted weight gauge so I'm not really sure how that I can't remember really why that works like that because on a size 8 needle it should really not be 12 stitches um, but I think it is lace so it does block out bigger than you would originally think uh, I have knit so many of these but this shawl is worked by sections with increases made only on the right side rows this creates a gentle curve for a shallow half round shawl I recommend using natural plant fiber yarn in a DK or worsted weight but you may use any yarn you wish my summer flies by but this lacy summer shawl is the perfect accessory to cover bare shoulders on a breezy summer evening it is one of my favorite designs ever it was the first pattern I ever knit with a checklist every row was written out row by row and that affected me deeply because if I set it down and didn't come back for three weeks I knew where I was at so I would highly recommend that here on Valentine's Day I thought it was just the perfect ending to put the pink shawl and the red shawl um, and talk about May a little bit um, and just kind of have a memory uh, on the podcast because I had introduced all of you to her. If you can hear my puppy howling, he's in the garage and he doesn't want to come in. He is not feeling well. He had an abscess on his hind end. Um, I won't get too graphic, but he, we were at the vet this morning and um, yeah, so he's now on two antibiotics and he does not feel good. He had hot head last week one day when Kylie was out and she said, why is Cody's head hot? And I said, I didn't know it was hot. Then I noticed it and then it, it didn't seem to continue, but he definitely has an infection and there's something going on. And she felt of his, and I have to go back in a week if it's not gone down, there's something going on there. So he's howling and I've gone twice now <laughs> and asked him to come in and the back door is cracked so he can come in if he wants but he's just laying out there and he what he really wants is me to go sit out there with him but I don't want to sit in the garage right now and he can come in and lay down right here but anyway he's been howling a lot more in the last year um, we used to call it singing and we loved it we thought it was funny because it was very intermittent but now it's several times a day and it's not fun anymore it's very loud and um, he does it when he's alone um, when he wants to be near us and like we have a like a baby gate in our mudroom because we don't like him in the kitchen when we're cooking and then we'll open that at night and we'll go in to sit down and watch TV and he won't come in but he'll howl back there and I'm like get up and just walk in the other room so you know curmudgeonly old man but I have his e-collar here and I've been using we use the noise you know the little beep to tell him to, to quit because and he's not stopping he's just gonna howl right through that mama he doesn't care enough and I hate having a dog on antibiotics because we all know what happens to their stomach so this is gonna be miserable he's not gonna be able to be in as much and anyway so um let's move I have on. a few things to tell you this week I have put all of my knitting pattern sets on sale so in the last year you know I I designed a whole bunch of you know 29 items and then I set up some sets so things that went together as a set like the betweenity hat cowl and mittens I put those as a set on Ravelry so instead of you having to go out and buy three different patterns for six or seven dollars each I clumped them together in a, in a set and I reduced the price and I had done that to a few other things like my up north cabin set which was a hat a cowl mittens and socks that's four patterns and so I put those together in a set and I got to thinking I have a few more things that weren't set up as sets and so now they are so I have the Anju pair set which is the hat, the cowl, and the socks, so three patterns. The betweenity, Use Your which, Own Path, which was from the Minnesota 52 book, which was a hat, a cowl, and fingerless mitts or mittens. Um, the Churchill Avenue hat and mittens. The Dog Words hat and cowl. The Friendship Road hat and sweater. The Knitting at the Library hat and cowl. 
the nice capades hat and sweater, the pump up the plaid blanket and pillow, and the Taco Tuesday hat and sweater. So there are 11 sets out on Ravelry that are discounted. So you either get two, three, or four patterns for anywhere from seven, eight, or nine dollars. Um, and then if you were on my newsletter list, you also got a coupon for a dollar off um, for, for any of those sets. So make sure you go over my website and get on my newsletter list because if I'm gonna have a sale, I'm gonna give those people who follow me and are like loyal customers a, an additional discount on things. But that um, will run through, I think the end of the month, I will update it if I didn't already, um, to run those sets. Um, will always be discounted, but I think that that dollar off coupon, if you got it and you haven't used it yet, I think I put it in February. Um, but they, they're they listed, and I'm gonna put a picture of when you go to the pattern page on Ravelry, and it has at the top, let's just say the Betweenity hat, there will be a, right under the title and the person's name, a published in area, and you can put where you publish those patterns. So like if it was in a magazine or a book, or a ebook, which is a set, it will list it there and you can click on that. So like all my pairs of socks collections, I've had some people not know where to find the collection and it's it's in every single listing. You just have to look at the top and it will say pairs of socks DK set, pairs of socks fingering set, or pairs of socks collection 10. Within that, you can click on that, it'll take you to the set page price. So if you don't know about that and you're looking at someone else's pattern and let's say you're looking at a hat and you didn't know they have matching mittens, you can look right where it's been public. It says published in and that's where designers can list anywhere that you can find it. And so ebooks, sets, an ebook a set is considered like an ebook and that's where anybody would put it. So that's where those are at. So I hope that I'm making that clear it's just something that you know, and when you don't know, you don't know that you ha you had no idea that that was there and that you can just click on that. So people have been having tr having trouble finding those pairs of socks ebooks and it's listed on every single pattern page. You just have to know to click on it and it's a link and it just takes you a different page on Ravelry. And then on that page, it will tell you what patterns are included and what the set price is you know, and you can check out from that page. You can click add to cart or buy it now. You know, they have the two options. Okay. Yeah, so you can go get any of those sets. Um, some of them are brand new. Like I finally setted them. I was like, oh my gosh, I never put this together as a set. And, um, and others have been sets for a while, but there are 11 of them out there now. And I just wanted to share that, that the price is greatly reduced. So, you know, you never have to buy from me things in that are in a set individually. I mean, you can. I have people who say, I'm buying these all individually. <laughs> but um, I do want to thank several of you um, from the last podcast for buying me a coffee um, over on the Ko-Fi app. K-O-F-I is an app where you can send people a few dollars for their work, whatever they did for you. You can just say, it's a nice way to say thank you to a friend. And you just log into the app, download it on your phone or whatever on your computer, and then you can send someone a cup of coffee. That's how it's kind of being known. Um, and so I had several people in the last, after each of the last podcasts, send me $3. Um, and one lady sent, sent me a little more to help me pay for some shipping on some of the Cal prizes, which was super cool. Um, I have the winners for the Pairs of Socks collection um, two-week drawing. And the first winner is So Run It, Suzanne. Suzanne, you won the Knit Swag mug. So I will contact Knit Swag, or you can, and she will put your name, or you could put whatever you want, on um, a mug, and she will ship it to you. So I, it doesn't have to be shipped to me, and then I reship it, because that makes no sense, right? So the Knit Swag is the company that put out all the stuff that had was knitting themed, right? They have notebooks and watches, and that's where I got my suitcase. And I had talked about that. And then last time, I forgot to add it as the giveaway, and she had offered to give a mug to one of the, you know, Knit Along winners, and I completely, it, things have been a little busy around here. And so I just wanted to, to remember and then say it again that you can go over to the knitswag.com 
and look at all the wonderful things that she has for sale that are knitting themed over there. Just super fun stuff. Um, so Su Suzanne, either reach out to me um, so that I know that you got in touch with Knit Swag or I will reach out to her and give her, um, she will need like your mailing address. Then uh, on Instagram, I chose number 19 and that is Bookworm Jen Knits. And Bookworm Jen Knits, you are going to win this awesome skein of yarn. So I got uh, donated a few yarn packages to give away. And so this one is a gradient that goes from kind of this brownish rust through to orange to light orange to teal. I thought it was perfect for the podcast. Um, and it would make great socks. It's um, MCN High Twist. So Bookworm Jen Knits, will you please get in touch with me and give me your address? You can send emails to Corey at irockknits.com. Um, and then I also have a package of stitch markers. I had a podcast viewer make me a counting chain, which is super nice. There is a how to use your knitting row counter um, video on YouTube. And you have a chain that can fit on your needle and then you can hang it down and then you can just move this clip every time you go around to one of the different chains or you can move the the little things up that's usually what i tend to do but they're just lovely and she does not sell these thank you dawn um but she made two and so i'm keeping uh the brighter orange one which was um which was this orange that's um little orange and white bead and she had them in these just lovely little you know bags that you get and so she made an extra one and um and i love these i i use them all the time i think they're great and then i had a bunch of silver stitch markers there's just a ton of them in here and some charms um, for putting on your knits and then i'm adding one of my i only have a few of these left it's a little rocking chair that i put on it and made my own stitch marker so i'm adding that to this little package and this is to number 190 on Ravelry and that is Woolstock and I should know your first name I think you're from Minnesota but your first name is not on your Ravelry and so I should know it but anyway get in touch with me you're from Minnesota your name is Woolstock on Ravelry and I will get that out in the mail to you okay I have a ton of to give away for this knit along and if you have not entered yet, there is still time. It is February 14th, this goes through the 28th. You have two weeks to knit a hat, a cowl, or one sock. You don't have to knit a pair, you only have to knit one. And chatter counts, so you can chatter away in the Instagram hashtags by pairs of socks cal. You can go over there and post up partly finished project or whatever or just chatter in the Ravelry group and there's been a lot of chatter going on. Oh, did you decide to come in now? He's been howling for 10 minutes. Decided to come in. He's got a cone on so he's not very happy. That's probably why he's howling now is that I really like. It's an inflatable one so it's better than the plastic one that they gave us at the, but anyway. Um, so the chatter is just going great over in that thread there are gosh i don't know 500 entry 500 entries yeah i guess that's what you would call it but um they were talking um in the most recent maybe in the last week or so they were talking about a new way to bind off and it was called the outline bind off and then someone referenced that roxanne richardson had a video uh, tutorial on YouTube on her Technique Tuesday. So then I went over and took a look at it and it is that bind off that um, matches the long tail cast on. So if you're a real stickler about you want your bind off and your cast on edges to look the same, you might wanna take a look at that. I will link it in the show notes, her video about that. It's called an outline. There are um, two other names for it too, I can't remember, but it's a sewn bind off. You s use your needle and thread to take um, your needle and yarn to take your stuff off the needle. So that, you know, you can always learn something new in Ravelry groups, I think, when people are sharing different items. So I just wanted to kind of, to mention that. I have an opportunity coming up to do some design, uh, to, to design 
work for a big yarn company and I had a conversation with them on Saturday and I don't think I'm gonna do it. Um, there are the two women that I talked with are really nice and I love that they love color but I think I am ready to slow down my design work. So um, we were, we've were we been chatting and I've been having this moment um, about how hard I worked last year. I talked about it and and how financially it is not feasible for me to continue to work the number of hours I work and sell six dollar knitting patterns intermittently, right? There, it's just not, I mean, I'm never gonna, well, maybe someday I would make, you know, a bunch of money that would reimburse me for my previous time spent, but it the it's just, in the last two years, I haven't been able to teach, and my teaching all also always sub kind of sub supplemented my income. And so last year and this year, looking at our taxes, my husband's like, "You're really you're spending full time work for you know like minimum wage few hours. Like you're just not it's not feasible unless you're really loving it. And a lot of times you don't love it, <laughs> and it have been crabby. Um, so." I think there's next two designs that I have. Um, I'm gonna take a little break. I have a secret, <laughs> a really big idea, project, that I have been working on for three or four years. It, I have a folder and every now and then I go in and I say, I'm gonna spend a little time on this today. And I don't, I'm not gonna say it out loud. It's not because I wanna be secretive. I just don't want anyone else to get the idea. Like it's one of those things where you're like, someone could take this and run with it and you're not putting any time into it. So keep it mom, right? <laughs> and so I talked to my husband about it. I talked to my daughter about it. And, um, and I will still be, I could still be working and busy will give me, you know, a purpose, but I wouldn't be doing it at, with $6 knitting patterns and it could have the potential to make a little more money for the time that I'm putting in. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm not trying to be, you know, all hush hush secretive. It's just that someone could be faster than I am <clears throat> at, at this and then I'd be like, well, that was my idea. Uh, you know, so you just don't wanna, you don't wanna give that up. I have a um, design collaboration with, um, a local yarn store and then I have the Christina Cowell to finish and then I'm just gonna kind of slow down and take a little bit of a, a time I have a folder of designs that I would love to write and it isn't as if I will never write them but I'm not gonna to kill myself in 2022 like I did last year and I get to start teaching so I'm going to Madison to the Madison Knitters Guild in uh, March and to Colorado in April and I'm starting teaching at the library um, Again, beginning knitting and beyond beginning knitting classes in April and May. I think I'm doing like six weeks of back-to-back, -back, two different classes twice a week. So like that is something I love doing. I love teaching and sharing. And you know, the payoff is better long-term for that. I don't tear my hair out when I teach. I don't yell and scream from the office and kick the floor and pout, be angry, hostile, aggressive. I just kind of wanted people to know I have a huge test knitting pool and I know that um, these last two patterns might be the last two I do for a little while and so um, I will put out word to them too that um, I'm going to be slowing down working on this other project for a little while and see. Um, anyway, I did speak to these two women and, um, and they want some pattern work done later in the summer. I'm finding that I, am, I hate working like that. <laughs> I didn't realize, but um, I love doing the collaborations this fall, but I put a lot of pressure on myself and the deadlines were super hard. And so I need to kind of take a look at that. So I'm not gonna ramble on anymore, but I just, I thought I would mention it, that sometimes you just have to kind of reevaluate your life and where you're at. And I loved sitting and knitting this sweater, just, just knitting. And I didn't have to write any notes and I didn't have to rip back and, you know, like if I missed a decrease on one sleeve, I just did it in the next round <laughs> and it was fine. <laughs> I am coughing. And so that video is going to be edited um, a little choppily. The more I talk, I get just this little scratch in my throat. 
but I was going to share that I have still like eight more bags to give away for the knit along. One, two, three, four different sets of yarn. And so maybe I should just show those quick. I have a mini skein set. I have another mini skein set. I have a Barocco yarn set. And then I have some Kate Davies um, yarn. That's all yarn to be given away along with um, the bags. And then I have, if I don't spill them all, some signature needles. So this is like big grand prize, right? I have 2.25 size one um, double pointed needles, signature double pointed needles are the stainless steel ones, as well as this size four 3.5 circular, 24 inch circular needle in, in signature needles which are super expensive and very very nice but I am a wood girl through and through and I do not use these and um, I have never used them <laughs> like they've just been sitting there maybe once I tried you know tried them but they're lovely and very nice so when I do the final drawing I'm gonna let um, the first few people pick the prize they want and then we'll just go down from there so somebody who doesn't never wants a signature needle wouldn't maybe get them so um, but I do have tons of prizes, and uh, that is all added to that knit along. You've got till February 28th, and I probably won't shut the thread until March 1st, um, just to give people in different time zones that option, right? So no matter what time it is in your time zone on February 28th, they're good to go. And then I will close the thread and draw on the next podcast. Um, and then I will ship out all this lovely stuff that's all over. Um, I do have a bag to share though. When I was at sweater camp, this woman that was sitting like right behind me at another table had this tote basket bag on the floor. And I was like, I love that. It just sat open. She had all kinds of stuff in it. And I was like, Will you would you be willing to share where you got that? And she's like, I got it on Amazon. And I was like, Okay, no problem, right? Like I hate Amazon, but I use them all the time, right? I know they don't pay their workers and they're not great employers and they're gonna take over the world, all those things. But this is the bag. And it's a pop-up bag. So it has a hard bottom and it has metal things on either side. See how that worked? And then you can pop them open so it's collapsible. So if you were going to an event, you could lay it flat in your suitcase um, and you know, shove your yarn in it. And then it had, this one had what I thought looked like knit stitches, right? And an orange handle. And there's like a, uh, this is like a herringbone, but there are four or five different colored handles and there's a couple of patterns. And I got it on Amazon and it is by, can you see this? Clever Made. I don't know if you can see the Clever Made. And this is like a, uh, vinyl. I don't think it's leather. It, they make it look like leather. Well, it could be. It feels kind of nice. But it was like $32, $30, $32, something like that. And um, I've had it on the dining room table because I wanted to talk about it. It's called a Snap Basket Lux. And I think I will just love carrying this. I don't think that the handles are long enough. She didn't think the handles were long enough for someone to like carry it over their arm because it's so wide. But I thought if you snapped it a little bit, it might be, you know, maybe you could carry it. Otherwise, you just have to carry it on your elbow. But I thought I would share it because we all need bag number 967, right? I did not need this at all. I have four things that could act just like this around my chair. But I had to have it. To order it right away when I got home and I put the yarn from sweater camp in it because that was a good purpose right you bought your new yarn so you have to have a special basket to, to hold it ridiculous ridiculous I know I've already chattered on quite a bit here today but I do have a real brief Corey story about two weeks ago my husband said to me, could you run a box to the post office? And I said, sure. 
the post office is eh, two miles from my house, right uptown, not clo not far at all. You have to go around a little lake, otherwise it would be, it would be even shorter. <laughs> um, but I said, sure, and then I said, is it heavy? And he says, yes, it's a car part. And I said, well, then at least put it out in my car for me. And he's like, okay, so he took it out and then we were doing something else. And then I was getting ready to go, I was putting my coat on and he said, try to keep your spending moderate as I went out the door. And I was like, I'm going to the post office. What does he think I'm gonna do? Go on a shopping spree? Buy three rolls of stamps? I'm, me I'm only going to put his package there and it's heavy. And I s turned around in the moment and I said to him, I have been keeping my spending moderate since 1986. He didn't think I was super funny, but I'm like, that's when I married you. And that's what you brought to our marriage. <laughs> Spending moderately. What he meant was it doesn't need to go priority, right? Like don't spend a lot to ship that package. But that is not what he said. And that sentence in itself could go on either one of our gravestones <laughs> if we pass because it would sum it up to a T. She hated spending moderately. He wanted her to spend moderately. We could have little <laughs> arrows pointing to one another. But I just want to share um, kind of a caveat to that, that in May's notes of what she wanted at the funeral, she said, I, you know, I want to be buried next to Jim, but my headstone could read, born a Democrat, died a Democrat, because everyone who's visiting a cemetery could use a little laugh. And so I will just leave you with that today. She was always very proud of being a Democrat. And I think, you know, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, being a Democrat was a lot different than it is today, as well as being a Republican. But so I will just leave you with that and know that you someday could go to a cemetery and have a little chuckle. I will see you all next time. Come in for your hug. And remember, keep it colorful. You'll never regret ripping back. Buy the gravy, waddle on. Don't complain with your mouth full. Keep your fork. I love you all.